spring and a wedding have come to a small New England town. Spring has come thumping into the hearts of a young couple. They've joined hands for a lifetime. But before they settle down, there's the excitement of a wedding trip ahead. Where are they going? <clears throat> they didn't say. Well, Nancy takes after her great-grandfather, and he was the skipper of a clipper ship. She has that faraway gleam in her eyes. The Virgin Islands? Nassau? They've only got two weeks. Dick must get back to his laws. Anyway, they promised to telephone the minute they arrive. In just a couple of days, they said. In a few hours, Nancy and Dick have made half the trip and paused at the top of the Mark Hopkins, high above San Francisco. They've taken a shortcut in the course set by old clipper ships around Cape Horn. As modern travelers, they might relax in Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, or Tacoma, Pan American's gateway cities to the Pacific. The routes of the flying clippers are traveled by young and old on business or pleasure trips. They've come to learn it's quicker by clipper. But today, the name means more than speed. It stands for comfort, seats with lots of leg room and space out of the way for Nancy's coat. The name also stands for service by the world's most experienced airline, its flight officers and cabin crews. the earth is a revolving stage, rolling out a giant show to which clipper passengers have a front seat. The curtain is going up on San Francisco Bay. Dick and Nancy will remember the great bridge rushing beneath their wings, the bay merging into the Golden Gate, the Golden Gate sweeping into the spreading waters of San Francisco's oceanfront. And all at once, life has become calm and restful, high above the shipping lanes of the Pacific Ocean. Magazine? No letters to catch up with on the table that slides out from the seat. Fresh air? Passengers can regulate the vent above their seat to suit themselves. The littlest passenger who was getting a free ride and plenty of attention can even have his bottle warmed and cry for his baby food kit, all ready for him in the galley. Compliments of the management. A clipper trip is full of new discoveries. For instance, there's sleeperette service. You just push a button in the seat and the back goes down. Then a leg rest slides out. You can change your position or your view. It's restful and convenient. By the way, where are you girls planning to stay? There must be something in the air that makes for sociability. Perhaps it's the spirit of adventure. Somehow it's easy to get acquainted, to make valuable new contacts with quite important people. Even the captain likes to take time out to meet his passengers, to share news flashes, and report the clipper's position on its course. It's reached the halfway mark from San Francisco. It would have covered almost the same distance from Seattle, Portland, and Tacoma 
or from Los Angeles. Dick and Nancy are getting a lot of travel information from their new friends. Before they know it, they've worked up quite an appetite. From appetizers to coffee, through steak, salad, and dessert. Their lunch is spread over 300 miles. Tactful Nancy picks the ideal time to suggest a future trip. Perhaps they can come through Los Angeles next time and visit Hollywood. After a meal like that, it's easy to get drowsy, to stretch out warm and comfortable for a good nap, far above earthly cares. fall asleep with thoughts of pleasant days to come. But the members of the crew are wide awake. While the navigator plots the clipper's course, the radio officer talks to the landing field makes a record of traffic conditions, of wind and weather, all to be reported to the captain. All's clear for a smooth landing. The clipper glides down over a glowing jewel in a setting of shimmering silk. It was a lovely dream and it's come true. Just two days from New England with one stopover, Nancy is about to see the land her great-grandfather reached after a long, hard battle with two oceans. The land that was first discovered by Captain Cook. It took him nearly three years to travel around the world. Dick and Nancy could make it in six days by flying clipper. Some other time. They're on their honeymoon, and they've reached their destination. Lays spell Hawaii and aloha. Aloha, which means hello or goodbye and come again. Aloha, which means anything it's nice to say like the island's welcome to their visitors. Right away, Dick and Nancy are made to feel that they belong. They meet the husband of a new acquaintance and are invited to another island. They mustn't miss a sunrise or a sunset over Maui's great volcano or fail to take a pack trip in the crater through huge and brilliant cinder cones. But first, they must see Waikiki. So it's aloha, welcome to Hawaii. You don't need a passport or a visa to get to Honolulu. It's an American city and the happy meeting place of East and West. Stores display the latest mainland styles, while bazaars offer oriental wares or Hawaiian specialties. On the street of the lay vendors, orchids, gardenias, and blossoms with exotic names are threaded by the thousands into garlands. They say it all with flowers in Hawaii for a song. And there's a song on every breeze. Under the banyan tree at the Hotel Moana on Waikiki, Hawaiian songs are broadcast to the mainland. Once a week, the hula takes the spotlight on the program of Hawaii Calls. After the show, visitors may drift over to the Royal Hawaiian for a dance at cocktail time. The sky is the roof and Diamond Head the backdrop.
After a turn on the dance floor, it's pleasant to sit about on the lawns of great hotels with famous names. Hale Kulani, Palms, Moana. Even in a lazy moment, you can watch other people having fun. and sun bright water to spark the fun, Waikiki is a summer playland all year round. It's ruled over by mainland visitors. Hawaiians call them malahinis and make only one request. Malahini leave troubles on mainland fleets. But the islands of Hawaii have other attractions. How and where can they be found? Tourists get help and friendly answers to all their questions. Here you are in Honolulu on Oahu. You can get to each island in about an hour by the inter-island planes of the Hawaiian Airlines to Kauai, to Molokai, to Maui, or to the big island of Hawaii. To get to Haleakala, you fly to Maui. And you can get a car to meet you at the airport, rent it by phone from here, and drive right up. What about a place to stay? Well, the Haleakala Mountain Lodge is near the top in the National Park itself. It's home-like and informal, and it provides horses for trips into the crater. Just as they promised at the airport, their new friends are taking Dick and Nancy over the top of an island into the crater of a dormant volcano, 10,000 feet above sea level, on a trail that winds gently down the crater wall to the floor, 2,500 feet below. This is the House of the Sun, Haleakala, nine miles long and three miles wide, deep enough to hold the clouds that drift in through two great gaps. Someday, Nancy may forget the sound of strumming ukuleles, but you will remember the great silence that followed her into the crater, broken only by the sound of hoofs and creaking leather. Legend has it that Maui, the Polynesian demigod, caught and held the sun here until it promised to give his mother time to finish her day's work. Hard to believe? Maybe. But who is to question the legends in Haleakala, where huge cinder cones are shrouded in a sea of clouds and nurture on their desolate slopes the rare, mysterious silver zone? In a grassy area bypassed by lava flows, while a park ranger explains that all the islands were built up thousands of years ago by eruptions which began in the ocean floor. Kilauea on the Big Island is still active. Hot steam rises continually. It's piped into the volcano house to provide hotel guests with natural steam baths. In the crater, a lava pit may boil up at any time. The burning rivers, flaming lakes, and fiery fountains can be watched in safety. When the show starts, people drop everything and rush to the volcano. spreads down the mountainside over old volcanic rock, long since eroded into the fertile soil of pastures, woods, and fields. 
lava flows reach the sea and circle coves, out to the coral reefs. Hawaiians live between shore and mountain, where shelter, food, and clothing present few problems. The weather is never cold, the lauders never bare. There's good hunting on the land and good fishing in the sea. To these people, the sea is a bountiful provider. Seaweed is a green vegetable that comes with its own salty seasoning. Opihi, tiny oysters with a sharp and biting taste, grow thick as berries. His net precisely draped and folded, the fisherman stalks his prey. This one works underwater with a spear. In one bite, he kills the squid and does away with an accusing eye. Pig to be washed and salted with seawater. Coconut meat to be shredded for dessert. Taro to be gathered, the roots scraped and steamed, then pounded and thinned with water into poi, the Hawaiian staff of life. All these preparations are for a feast, a luau to which Dick and Nancy have been invited. Dick is picking up a new recipe for Nancy's notebook. Dig ground oven, place red hot stones on pig, cover with leaves, and bake till done. Leaves are cut to make a table pad, and the ground serves for the table as well as for the cooking stove. Dick and Nancy have joined in to help prepare the food and set the table. It's sprinkled with flowers and decorated with a centerpiece of pineapples, mangoes, and papayas. Dinner is ready now, and over the fruits of the land and of the sea about to be enjoyed, a blessing is spoken. No, you couldn't know you call and we may call up make a loud make up and never make up to one. Amen. Then hands and fingers go to work. A quick twirl in the poi follows a mouthful of pig and trimmings served in leaves and coconut shells. Poi and chicken, poi and fish, salmon rubbed with onions and tomatoes called lomi lomi, poi and taro leaves in coconut milk called luau also the name of this traditional feast. It wouldn't be a luau without a hula. Hawaiians are cheerful people. They sing and dance what they feel like saying. These are the after-dinner speakers, and they have all kinds of stories to entertain their guests. The hula is an art of many moods. History, legends of Hawaiian kings and heroes, love songs. Poems in praise of nature's beauty. Ancient hulas were pagan hymns, once chanted by a priest to the rhythm of gourds and calabashes. But always in a hula, words are expressed in the sign language of the dancer's hands.
today, a new sound swells into the island symphony. Modern travelers get a comprehensive view from the inter-island planes of the Hawaiian Airlines. These islands were first conquered and united by Kamehameha, Hawaii's greatest king. Today, they're outposts of the United States and the Pacific under territorial rule. At the highest point in the Pali Road, Nancy and Dick lean hard against the trade wind to see vast panoramas of rich cultivation. Great fields of sugar cane, Hawaii's largest industry, spread to the shoreline. They produce the highest sugar yields per acre in the world. Crops are maturing in some fields, while others are planted and harvested. Fire running quickly along the ground clears rubbish from the stalks. Then field workers cut the cane and haul it to the mills for crushing and shipping to refineries on the mainland. Pineapple, the second largest crop, grows on the higher slopes. It's cultivated according to the latest findings of scientific agriculture. Almost all the pineapple in the world comes from Hawaii, canned and packed in island factories. On great ranches, Hawaiians ride horses as skillfully as they ride the ocean waves. They're called pañolos, after the Spaniards and Mexicans who brought cow punching to the island. Dick and Nancy hadn't expected to watch a cattle branding and were surprised to learn that the second largest ranch in the United States is in Hawaii. Dick would like to go in for some dude ranching, but Nancy has had enough. So has the cat. The entertainment of visitors is another major island industry. Nature provides the views, but islanders stage the events, which are sure to be taking place somewhere at any time. Like the Hukilau, a community fishing party with a huge net spread in a semicircle and pulled to shore. Those who work divide the catch. There's more than enough for all. Driving about the islands, loafing on shaded lawns or in lanais, the open porches found in all Hawaiian dwellings, stopping overnight in one of the outer islands for a quiet interlude, getting away from it all in a small boat built for two. Driving a ball against the backdrop of a mountain or swimming pool. Visitors in hotels on all the islands live in the open, surrounded by luxury and varied entertainment. There's entertainment in the tradition of different lands. The islands have attracted many people from the Orient. They've brought their religions and their languages, their customs, their special ways with food. Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, and Filipinos all add their own bright accent to the island color scheme.
From Samoa come savage colors, flashing, razor sharp. Since they left home not quite two weeks ago, Nancy and Dick have been traveling fast. From the time their flying clipper touched the runway, they have enjoyed the island's entertainment, hospitality, and stimulating sports. They've come to know a land that has risen from the sea to bask in year-round sunshine, a land of happy, carefree people. They've absorbed a bit of the traditions, the legends, the magic that is Hawaii. Nancy and Dick will tell their friends about all these things, but how will they express the feeling of catching a wave and racing through the wind and spray?